Hi, everyone. Oh. Thank you for coming. So this talk is going to be about uh, sidechains, Plasma Cash, Covenants, Bitcoin, and a bunch of other things. Uh, my name is Georgios. Uh, I do consulting and research for various people at the moment, and my focus is primarily on uh, mechanism design, off-chain scalability, and information security. And if you want the slides, like to walk like with me, like it's at that website. So some related work which I won't go through right now is like a plasma nocust, uh, like some work by Peter Todd and Greg Maxwell like a few years ago, as well as like a new system by John Adler and like others. There's like the big um, question, yeah, the slides here got a bit skewed. Um, how do we scale? And for Bitcoin, like we've seen like a lot of ways for scaling by increasing basically the semantic density of transactions, which was an idea that I first read by Nick Carter in one of his blog posts where he says that uh, basically transaction costs some amount. How can we reduce that um, transaction's uh, cost? Where the cost can, e can either be like transaction fees or actual like how, how much does that transaction affect the cost of running a full node? And when we make the cost of running a full node cheap, this is good for like our blockchain. And there are like bigger blocks, which bigger blocks increase the cost of um, running our blockchain, like Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, and other approaches, which this is not the subject of today's talk. So we don't like big blocks, just to be clear. And so let's explore the solutions to that. So we focus on layer two. Like, let's do a history lesson, because those who don't read history are doomed to repeat their mistakes. Firstly, we had uh, this paper. Well. Not exactly, because uh, it turns out that for every idea that you see in a paper, there's a Bitcoin talk blog post like from like two or three or five years before it. So um, the paper was actually like a very good read like to for understanding the concept. But initially, like Satoshi in 2010 wrote like about the term sidechains. However, what he was actually referring to was like merge mining, which was like developed, like used like for multiple altcoins back in the day. Um, soon after, we had like Greg Maxwell with like Coin Witness, which is like a technique similar to ZK Rollup that I'm going to talk about later, where he says, okay, let's take the state of chain and prove the state transition with some moon math and then store the new state, like which is going to be like very small. And then we have like this guy, Killerstorm, which uh, who is like still working on similar stuff to, to date. Uh, who describes SPV using SPV proofs, which I will dive into very soon, um, to do basically to offload computation from one chain to another, either for scalability, interoperability, experimentation, which like uh, Blockstream talks about a lot in their paper, and so on. And the big question that we're trying to like um, answer is like how the question of observability, how we can have one chain in an objective way, so no, like uh, nobody like helps the chain, tells it like this is the other chain state, with an objective way like to tell what is the state of the other chain. And uh, a very, the big breakthrough that like Nakamoto showed like that we can attach work, which is like very, very objective because it's electricity. And uh, we like soon after we saw that we can use work and SPV proofs like to observe another chain state. How? Like. With SPV, basically SPV says that uh, as a light client, what you're doing is that you, instead of having to validate all the consensus rules, you trust the miners who follow like a protocol that is supposed to be incentive compatible. And what happens is that you're fed, you're being fed as a light client, like a bunch of uh, a hash, a hash of a header, another header, another header, another header, along with Merkle proofs about the inclusion of certain transactions in that header. And uh, what you need to do is that when I have to show you that the transaction was indeed included as a light client, I give you like all the SPV proofs for it. If you're a light client, like you don't need to get like everything, you need to get, you get them like as you sync. If you're a smart contract uh, that needs to get convinced about the state of another chain, ideally you must be given all the Merkle proofs of inclusion like since, like you must be given sufficient proof that the chain you're being given is the longest chain. And this is done by giving you everything from Genesis. But that is linear, which is like horrible because the chain grows fast and um, that's too expensive to validate in a smart contract currently in the existing smart contract platforms that I know. So techniques to solve that are Nipopaus. There's two Nipopaus techniques, one by Benedict Boons and others, and the other by Dionysus Indros. 
the superblocks nipple pause and the fly client nipple pause. Fly client says that instead of having the normal hash chain, we're going to have a Merkel mountain range of hashes, and that plus like a fine-tuned probability distribution is going to allow us to be convinced that the chain we're receiving is the longest chain. Superblocks makes the observation that uh, a few blocks have like encode information, encode more information about the current chain that is being worked on, and it uses that to achieve like logarithmic size of proofs. The other approach is SNARKs, which uh, like we discussed like two days to a big extent at the Zero Knowledge Summit, which basically you use a zero knowledge proof to attest that, the, that I know that the chain I'm giving to you actually uh, is the heaviest chain. And this is very convenient because uh, in the previous slide I showed that Litecoin script to verify, there exists a verifier contract that can verify Litecoin script, and, um, but it's 20 million gas. The one approach to it was to solve it by using Trubit, which to be seen, and the other approach is to use a snark, which currently people have been working on and I believe that it's the future to that. The other approach is a stateless SPV, a solution developed by James Prestwitz and uh, Suma which says that I give you a transaction and I also give you six blocks on top of that transaction. And as long as like, and it gives you some sort of economic security because it says, okay, if that transaction had like six blocks built on top of it with that much hash power, this much hash power costs like this much. So you have like some economic guarantee on how likely that transaction is to be actually part of the longest chain. So let's go through like an example. So we have Alice, the usual suspect. Um, she has like a Bitcoin, she sends it to a deposit script, so I'm going to use like kind of like a Bitcoin terminology for this, but it applies to script, like think of it as smart contract. Alice sends it uh, to the deposit script, she waits some confirmations where K is like the security parameter that you use. Um, bigger K, you're more likely, like you're more convinced that the transaction is like not going to get reorged. Smaller K, less guarantees about the reorg, better UX, trade-offs. Um, Alice will take that transaction and she will broadcast an SPV proof with kappa confirmations, where the SPV proof in this case can be anything that I said earlier. Then the miners of the other sidechain will mint a coin because they actually saw that, okay, like an SPV proof was minted and according to the consensus rule, we must create new coins. And uh, for Alice to withdraw her coins, she will send her money to like um, a burn address. Again, the miners will include the transaction, and then Alice will wait some confirmations, and she will broadcast the proof. Note that uh, to unlock like the coins originally, that were originally locked. Note that uh, this has the issue, quote unquote, that both chains need to be individually secure. So like if for whatever reason the other proof of work sidechain is a sidechain with low hash rate, which you can reliably censor, uh, you, have, uh, you have a problem. So the security assumption like rapidly like, changes a lot. So what about proof of stake sidechains? So in the end, like, uh, I'll give a reference like, to a paper that uh, describes that. A proof of work block says I have a hash. If the hash of that block is like, less than the current difficulty, which adjusts every some amount of time, I accept that block. A proof of stake block looks like this. It has like this, the usual stuff. It has some signatures instead of a hash. And uh, you accept the block if you see that the stake uh, inside that block was like two thirds of the total stake that you had last observed. And how does a proof of work to proof of stake sidechains uh, thing work? So note that in this, case, in this slide, I don't have like, um, like nothing here. I have a multisig, which is uh, in the one way, like you don't have a multisig, you have a script. In this case, like instead of having a script, like you have like some multisig which expresses the validators of the proof of stake sidechain. So basically what happens is that I spend to a deposit script on the main chain, where the deposit script is um, controlled by the proof of stake sidechain's validators. And so I will wait kappa confirmations, I will take the proof of work um, SPV proof, and I will take it and I will put it on the sidechain, as before. However, uh, when I want to withdraw, note that now we have like uh, the validator set which is the same, like in both chains. So what happens is that indeed I burn my coins, but instead of uh, having to like broadcast an SPV proof, um, how are you going to do an SPV proof on a proof of stake sidechain? There is no notion of work, there is no objective meter, uh, metric. 
uh, because stake is costless and like cue all the usual proof of stake criticism. And I'm not here to criticize proof of stake, but it's, it's a fine point that like we do not have an objective manner to value, validate that the transaction was included. So what we do is that instead of having work, we kind of trust the validators to do their action correctly. Uh, so indeed the validator multisig will execute the withdrawal. Um, and there is also a concept of elections in proof of stake sidechains, usually such as Tendermint and whatnot, as chains which are built using Tendermint. So you have elections, so every certain amount of blocks, like the validator set, uh, changes. So once the election happens, indeed the validator set on the proof of stake sidechain changes, but notice that like now I have put my money in a multisig owned by V, and now the, the multisig actually should be V, v prime. So like these guys, what's happening? Like can they steal my money? So what should happen is that the old stake, the validators of the previous multisig, the owners of the previous multisig, if they act properly, they should take the money from the multisig and spend it to a new multisig. And um, if they do that, okay, like the two chains have the same validator set and I'm in a good spot. I know that like if the proof of stake side chain is secure, also my funds are secure on the proof of work chain are secure like as long as they follow the rules. And also what you can do, which is not seen currently in the proof of stake side chains, uh, in the proof of stake chains on their own, is that proof of stake chains suffer from the long range attack, where the long range attack shows that uh, basically a validator that uh, is no longer bonded can go back to the past and create an alternative chain, and then you cannot know which chain is which. And uh, Sarah Azuvi, which is in the audience, proposed like a mechanism like to counter this uh, in her paper. There is like an also another approach to countering this by Raphael Pass called consensus through herding, which I believe we will hear about tomorrow. But another approach is that you can use a proof of work chain instead to checkpoint the current state of, the, um, of your side chain. So this is like a nice uh, benefit. And uh, of course, like uh, indeed, the long range attack still could happen. However, it can only happen if you can break the proof of work of the main chain. So the idea is that you will use a proof of work chain with like high hash rate like Bitcoin or Ethereum in order not to get, uh, have that problem. And um, there's an obvious attack. Like um, what if they don't want to update the multisig? What are you gonna do? So there is this unbonding period like while you're in the sidechain which says that like you cannot unbond your funds instantly. So if I have locked like 32 ether on Ethereum and I have like to, and I want to unbond, like I indeed like the validator said does change, but I have to wait like a certain amount of time until I can take my money out. And the idea should be that like you should, the multisig should not be updatable until the validators have been like a full, sorry, like the validator should not be unbonded before the multisig has been updated. So like a good mechanism, uh, which I have not seen yet implemented, is that uh, you will take the SPV proof of the spend, and only then would the validators from this, from this like validator set get unbonded. And the idea again is that um, if the validators have more to lose than the money that's on this multisig, they will act honestly, because cost to attack is more than cost to cooperate. So we have a very nice taxonomy, which was uh, very, very nicely described in the paper that I cite over here, which you should all read, which says we have the federation, which is just a multisig, and uh, multisigs are great and like an amazing primitive, but like for our threat model, they're horrible. You have a proof of work sidechain, which basically will use some form of like a logarithmically growing SPV proof, plus maybe some reorganization proofs, like if you're in the proof of work, proof of work um, uh, scenario. Plus, uh, in the side of the proof of stake sidechain, you will have basically a rotating multisig, which is indeed weighted by stake, and you add like some uh, slashing for like if they try to equivocate, if they try to misbehave. And if you want, like you can also add like the checkpointing mechanism that I described earlier. But the, uh, like the common denominator in all of this is the collateral, where in the federation, the collateral is like the reputation. The collateral here is the hash rate that exists in the proof of work sidechain. The collateral here is whatever like you have staked. So like if that is more than the, um, if you have more to lose than what you have put in the sidechain, sure. Um, but uh, uh, you cannot rely on that. Like capital, firstly, is like uh, very very expensive, and secondly, what if like, um, yeah, sorry, these are like some references on this, and uh, we were working on TBDC, which also takes ideas from this uh, setup. So. Um, this is a paper that describes how to do proof of stake to proof of stake sidechains. 
uh, but it does not uh, by uh, Mrs. Zindros and others, who is the Nippo Pau's author. However, it does not go in depth exactly on how we would like counter like, uh, like the incentives of such attacks. And the problem basically with all the tactics to do sidechains is that they take care of rational and not Byzantine adversaries, because if I want to steal your money and if I'm a state actor and don't want you like, to transact ever with your whatever coin, I don't care about the money, I'm gonna like, be Byzantine. And uh, also, yeah, okay, collateral does align the incentives, but like, why will I put my collateral like, to protect your money and um, follow the consensus rules and not put it into compound finance and uh, earn whatever interest um, exists for that? So enter layer two, like the thing that we've been listening to for like years and layer two here, layer two there, where is layer two, where is the scalability? So there's a safety goal that, uh, so and, sorry, and when I say layer two, I always assume that the layer one is a proof of work chain that can give us like some reliability, reliable guarantees about the um, censorship resistance and the stickiness of transaction, like a transaction not getting reorged after it has been included. And the safety goal is that like, if you are a non-miner, there should be no way for you to like influence how like um, an honest user, the ability of an honest user to with other funds. And uh, okay, non-miner might be the wrong word here. Like uh, I want to, I didn't find a better word, but like non-miner plus person willing to like bribe the miners. So like if the miner incentives are like, properly aligned, even in the presence of bribery, uh, you should always be allowed to withdraw your money. And uh, there is an attack on the systems which I, I will describe before the end of the talk. And the assumption is this. And the main uh, assumption uh, is that you can include this dispute transaction before some timeout. And the longer the timeout, of course, the worse the UX, because why would I wait like, for a month to get my funds out? But it increases the security, because it says that for somebody has to reorg one month's worth of transactions. And like, I haven't seen a one month reorg yet in Bitcoin, so I feel good. And the primitives that we're using for all of this is basically state machines, Merkle trees, signatures, so very, very simple stuff. And this is the simple stuff that allows you to do mechanisms with uh, fraud proofs, which have the problems of uh, like some synchrony assumptions, and also zero knowledge proofs. But like I'm not a mathematician, and zero knowledge proofs are a bit like novel and complex, and they do not fit like in this time slot for this talk. Um, how can we do this on Bitcoin though? Because the talk is uh, about Bitcoin. So smart contracts on uh, Ethereum, we kind of know how to do most of this. So in order to have state machines, we need a primitive called uh, a covenant. And uh, a covenant basically is a construction which allows you to restrict where your UTXO gets spent. And uh, O'Connor at the Bitcoin workshop very, very nicely said that initially Bitcoin day one had digital signatures. Who can spend the Bitcoin? With time logs, we describe when the Bitcoin can be spent. And indeed with like, these two like, very lean constructions along with SegWit gave us lightning. However, the covenant is a technique which allows you to specify how and where your Bitcoin gets spent. So if I want to send some money to Stefan and say, okay, this money is now yours, but you can only use it for donations, I cannot do it right now on Bitcoin. I could perhaps do it with pre-signed transactions, which are like um, a technique that I will describe soon, but um, it's, uh, how to say, it, it limits you in the things that you can do. And the use cases are multiple, so let me dive into that. Like vaults are like the clear use case where like a vault is basically a way to say that uh, if you have like some funds and uh, your private key gets stolen, uh, you should still be able to claim your funds somehow. How do you do that? You have a hot key and a cold key. And basically it says that if your hot key gets stored, gets stolen, you have um, let's say a week until which you can submit a transaction by your cold key which will send your funds back to another address that you control. Um, Parallelist proof, colored coins, congestion control, they're like all similar like, uh, ideas and techniques. The idea that we want though is like the fraud proofs, which allows us to do like side chains with uh, trust minimized reverse peg. And there's like, of course, like more ideas in the mailing list, Bitcoin talk, like some telegram chat as usual. Um, the covenant designs that exist, the one which was like specified by the first like academic paper because probably there was like again a mention of covenants uh, years before but let's stick to the academic work so far. Um, it was object output which basically says Alice spends to Bob and Bob can only spend to a regular expression uh, that Alice specified. 
And this is way, way, way too powerful because like, if you have a problem and you add a regular expression on it, now you have two problems. So it's a bit um, problematic. Uh, the other approach, which is my favorite so far, is the opcat plus opcheck sig from stack by O'Connor and Piekarska again, uh, which is actually implemented or added, I believe, in uh, elements. Opcat is an opcode which allows you to concatenate two elements. Check sig from stack is like um, so currently Bitcoin transactions. They do not allow you to verify a message that the user passes um, and some signature. They only allow you to like uh, check that the signature that was submitted is valid. And for example, like if I want to say that uh, some oracle value is that much and uh, this guy signed it, I cannot check it. So it's a nice extra feature. Uh, check output hash verifier was a more limited kind of version from check output, like with, it was like uh, oriented toward safety. It was literally refined to secure the bag, which Jeremy is working right now on and you should definitely take a look at. And the final idea was like uh, push TX data, which basically says that you can inspect like the outputs of a transaction along with other information. So basically you would build a state machine by saying, by specifying that the output of your output must have specific um, structure. And uh, pre-signed transactions is this uh, technique which uh, we haven't seen that much in Ethereum because we have like stateful smart contracts, but it says that like, um, like I will only do something, so I will only spend to you if you pre-sign a transaction which says that you will make a certain spend. So basically, if I were to send Stefan some money, I would only send to him if he already gave me a signature which says that the output that he will receive is only spendable in a certain way. And by using certain time locks and other like, uh, nice techniques, that's how we got Lightning. So a case study on this. So Plasma and Plasma Cash was a technique by Vitalik and Joseph, which was like earlier described uh, in shadow chains plus some like extra ideas which says that you, indeed, you have a side chain or like whatever, like you have some guy that holds some state of chain. And that guy, instead of like uh, checkpointing the state naively, he merkleizes the state, he puts the state on chain, on the proof of work chain, so this is like a similar technique again as, to, as the one that we used in the proof of stake side chains. However, the difference is that if you want to like uh, withdraw your assets, you will play like a, a game. And uh, the game is expressed by by a state machine. And so it basically says that, um, and this is like a very simple state machine for the plasma cache, but there have been like more complex proposals and ideas. And the idea is that like, okay, when you deposit your funds, you are at state QA, and uh, you're transacting with your funds off chain, and uh, during each state transition that you make off chain, like there is a checkpoint of that state transition uh, along with other people's state transitions in a Merkle route. And when you want to exit, like when you want to withdraw your money, you will make an attestation to the layer one. And so when you were the deposited state um, over, over, whatever. Um, when you were in the deposited state, um, then you will, uh, like, you will be able to transition to the exited state. And the, for the plasma state machine, there was like an idea that like there's two type of challenges, an interactive and a non-interactive challenge. For the simple cases, the interactive, the non-interactive challenge instantly allows you like to transition back to the deposited state. And for the non for the interactive challenges, you had a counter, like that counter gets incremented or decremented depending on the type of challenge. And if that counter is zero after some time, which is the dispute period, you are able to indeed take your money out. And uh, the same applies for the non-interactive challenge. If nobody challenges your exit within some time, you're able to take your money out. And that technique like, is seen like, in all layer two systems with fraud proofs, which we call like, usually optimistic systems. And uh, how we do that uh, on Bitcoin would be, for, so I give here the example of check output verifier, which is the, uses the check output code. And uh, like, if you were to write it in like, some higher like, help, helper language like Ivy or Miniscript, you would do something like that. You'd say, okay, you have the current script, and you would add like, some extra helper function, which takes the arguments, the next pattern, and it like, puts a check output op code on top. And uh, if you want like, to take extra arguments, you will use the op pick or like, other op codes to inspect like, inputs of the script. And uh, however, like, the critique I received for like, opting for this transaction was that, of course, like, this adds loops, because uh, we just saw a state machine that goes back. And like, this, is, like, this cycle is Turing completeness, and uh, Bitcoin does not want Turing completeness 
um, as far as I know. So the technique by Jeremy Rubin for the secure the bug says that, okay, you can kind of do loops, but you can only do like a finite amount of loops. So as long as you can kind of bound it, it's not really a loop, it's just like a very long statement. Um, so this is like currently work in progress, so I'm not sure if it's like the best technique, but it's like the best that I know of like at present moment. And for the medical proof verification that is required for Plasma, you will add like a very simple opcode uh, which does this. Uh, the alternative would be to add like some, concat like if you had like uh, the concatenation of code back, you would be able to say message one, message two, concatenate, hash, and proceed to the next level for everyone that's familiar with how medical proof works. Um, but okay, like I'm just like describing an idea for this. Uh, check sig from stack, uh, which I think like everybody like in the Bitcoin community that's like open to new ideas like kind of likes it as an idea. Uh, it would basically take like all the inputs of a transaction, it would like uh, concatenate them, it would hash them, so yeah, I need a hash over here, and uh, it would check the signature from the operator, and if the operator's signature is there, like it will turn one, and that will get accepted by the like state transition. Okay, so this all, like, uh, we've kind of known of all of this, like, uh, rather, the, all of this has been written, like, and seen, like, on the internet for, like, like a year plus by now. So there was a recent technique, uh, which was not, maybe not so recent, but, like, let's say it recent, um, which is called optimistic rollup, which uh, is being worked on by some very talented people right now, uh, which says that, what if we want to like do like more complex state transitions? Because currently the plasma technique it allows you to do only very stupid transactions like A sends to B, and maybe you can add some time block, maybe some multisig, but the thing is that you're very like limited. And also plasma is trying to work around the infamous like data availability problem, which says that like what if uh, like this operator which like puts this arrow, um, they like indeed they commit a hash, but they never like reveal the, Mer the full Merkle tree. And if you're not uh, aware of the Merkle tree or the Merkle proofs that are relevant to your state, uh, how are you going to make the exit statement later? So Plasma tries to work around that like, by, saying, by trying to design a very like, specific, very limited exit game, which is safe even under data and availability. Uh, but these restrictions, they get you like, to Plasma Cash, which does not have fungible coins, and, and a bunch of other stuff, which have like, uh, like, taken a lot of effort. So what if, like we say that, okay, plasma is a premature optimization, uh, let's try to not solve the data availability problem, but try to kind of like, like work around it in a way. And what we're doing is that instead of like committing only the 32 bytes of the transaction, we also take all the tree, the whole tree that was like off chain, and we will encode it. So I'm not going to say if this is a good idea or bad idea. It depends on like if, uh, how good your encoding is. And like if the, if the layer one should be used only as a dispute layer, this takes the approach that it also uses the layer one as a data availability layer. And it's kind of based on the idea that you separate like consensus from execution completely. And there's a similar paper by Mustafa Al-Bassam which called Lazy Ledger, Lazy Ledger which like proposes like very, very similar uh, ideas. Uh, so this, this is shown to work. So like the Plasma Group team demoed something at uh, DevCon like two weeks ago or less. Uh, which basically shows an integration between this and Uniswap, and you get a, like an off-chain Uniswap that still kind of works, which is very nice. The other idea is to use a zero-knowledge proof. So this is the only side that I show zero-knowledge proof. There's no math here to be shown, um, which says that, okay, you're still committing 32 bytes and an encoding of the transactions because data availability problem, and you also add a zero knowledge proof. And what happens with a zero knowledge proof is that the operator, whenever they submit the new 32 bytes, they must submit like some zero knowledge proof which can be verified like within reasonable gas limits. And uh, that is like, you replace basically the exit game with the zero knowledge proof attesting that the state transition was valid. And this is excellent. Uh, however, tough math, like a lot of prover time and like verifier time on chain, which may get better, which looks like it's getting better, so maybe ZK rollup might eat optimistic rollup, but we don't know. But what if we do optimistic ZK rollup? So the idea here would be that if the verifier is too expensive to compute each time, like here, because you put the zero knowledge proof, and you also have to run the verifier. And the verifier, what if the verifier, such as in the case of a uh, Stark, 
it costs 7 million gas, like it's a bit, um, it's costly. And the uh, Ethereum block has 8 million or 9 million gas. And what if like I see your 7 million gas transaction and I don't want you to put it in, so I, I sneak in a 1 million point, like, a, like a, an equivalently big transaction, which the miners choose to include. So I can like kind of dose it if the proof is like way too big to verify. Uh, so what you could do is that you can say, okay, instead of verifying the zero knowledge proof, post it so that like everybody knows that you attested that this is the zero knowledge proof, and uh, you verify like clients would verify it off chain, and only if the zero knowledge proof is not valid would you actually like uh, perform the verification because I am watching the operator. If they try to mess me up, I will take the zero knowledge proof, I will verify it, I will post to the chain, I will take like a big security bond from them or something similar. Um, so yeah, this is the idea. Like there's a few takeaways from this. So when we want like to do non-custodial like um, systems, uh, which are not like based on the trust, we align incentives uh, via collateral or we design state machines uh, which operate correctly under some synchrony assumption. Uh, the collateral indeed is expensive. The synchrony assumption is also kind of expensive, like if you think that uh, you have to trust like the miners and maybe like the miners get bribed. And um, the idea is like you use that by doing state machines. The state machines on Bitcoin, they're very, very hard to do. Uh, on Ethereum too, like we can't do multisigs even, like, yeah. And uh, there's like this sort of like next generation of like where the layer two space is moving towards to, which says that you use the roll up as the layer one of the layer twos. So like if you were to build like a payment channel or state channel system, you would build it on top of the roll up. And maybe like the, um, and this is a quote by Ben Jones of Plasma Group. And the idea would be that like you have like the, diff the layer two stack, which looks like proof of work chain, roll up chain, uh, plasma on top channels and maybe like if you want uh, interoperability and like even more on that you can use interledger protocol like too many buzzwords but like bear with me and um, if we get like zero knowledge proofs that can operate like fast and cheaply uh, without like a setup that is like hard to verify so like a trusted setup that's done by one party by six parties by like that's not continuous that's not universal uh, again, keywords for zero knowledge proof. Like, if we get that, it's going to be amazing. But until we have that, like, I think that there is still merit in exploring like uh, systems which are designed like based on this type of like state machine around like incentives. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I think I have like eight minutes. So if there is any questions, I can get into them, or I can describe the earlier attack I mentioned on uh, layer one systems with fraud proofs. Uh, yeah. So basically, it doesn't have the same problem, but it's seen less because you don't have to like prove it every single time. Verify yes. it every so single time. So ZK rollup in the, so this thing does not have a liveness assumption. It has no synchrony assumption about you withdrawing your assets. You can always withdraw your assets because indeed the state transition was always valid if your zero knowledge proof was good. Uh, in this case, the um, like good and bad is that like you don't use it like to improve on this. You use it to improve on this because you still have a, um, a single assumption, but what if the state machine that you want to put on this system is too big to verify? So it's like in the same idea as like in the SPV proof and SNARK scenario, where the SPV proof for Litecoin, which always Litecoin is used as an example, it's like it's never used in real life, right? Uh, so um, instead of like uh, using like verifying S script or like a very complex state machine in this type, you make a zero knowledge proof about the state machine. The thing is that if someone um, tries to DOS you by like submitting a transaction, the same example you said, right? Mm -hmm. They can also do it here, but uh, it's going to happen less um, less times because you don't have to like send every single proof to the, to the chain, right? Sorry, uh, why is he going to have less time? No, I mean like when you're describing in the optimist in the Zika rollup, the normal one, mm -hmm. where like let's say that the proof is like uh, cost seven million gas to to process, mm -hmm. right, to verify. Yep. Then if someone wants to like DOS you, they send like a huge transaction, yep. uh, and then your proof it has to get be bigger here. Yeah, exactly. It costs so, you more, much more, like to try to DOS. Okay. Which the cost basically becomes fill the entire block until he cannot like uh, post the proof. 
So like, and maybe in this case, like you will use it like for simpler statements. All right, yeah. Okay, I guess I can like explain the attack perhaps. So um, the idea is that, okay, like so far I said that, um, what if the attacker, like uh, I did not consider minor attackers. So indeed, like our assumption is that the layer one like works. Uh, what if the layer one is bad or what if like uh, we have some problem in incentives? And for example, like uh, attacks which explore that like that the layer one does not exactly work are like attacks which are around the selfish mining like type of um, attacks. So what if like a, a miner knows that uh, you have some state of chain and uh, let's say I have a, a channel with Sergey, and uh, Sergey says, goes to the miner and says, hey, like if uh, you censor this guy's uh, justice transaction, like the dispute transaction for one day, so like just for one day, so we assume that the miner has like 51% of the hash rate and is rel can reliably like perform like uh, arbitrary reorgs. Um, what if uh, like I tell you, hey man, like um, please censor out this transaction, like everything else can look normal, and uh, what we'll do is that um, you will censor it, and then uh, after the one day completes and I take his money, I will also use a smart contract to also pay you like the, um, the rewards. So the attack here is that what if the layer two has like millions and millions of dollars on top of it, and uh, the miner uh, is able to somehow like extract like more value by censoring this transaction instead of like uh, forfeiting some blocks. So like the idea here is that like um, you can kind of, the layer two system cannot like exceed the value held in it um, compared to like the amount uh, that's going to be lost by a miner um, if they, so a layer two is secure if and only if like the amount that's in it cannot be, cannot be censored for long enough like by a miner by losing like um, rewards. So if like, it, if like there's like one week of reward, one week's worth of rewards that I was going to lose, um, I should not be able to, like, I should always choose to, like, mine. While in this case, what happens is that because I have 51% of the network, I always get all the rewards because I'm a miner, and because I, I, I always have the longest chain, and then I also have, like, a kind of plausible deniability that I was not attacking because it was only, like, one transaction that I was censoring. So, and this is, like, dangerous in the case of, uh, like, the plasma, because uh, like one transaction can be used to like withdraw all the money, which uh, initially was described as a mass exit attack. Yeah, I did not phrase that very well, but that's the idea. Okay, and I'm probably out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>